morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Radek Špicar. I'm uh, the executive director of Aspen Institute Prague, uh, which is one of the two institutions co-organizing our today's panel. The other one is Prague 20, headed uh, and founded uh, by Vladimir Dlouhý. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all, welcome you all and thank you all uh, for accepting uh, our invitation. It's great to see that uh, Euro is of such uh, great interest to so many of you, despite the fact that Czech Republic is still uh, not a member uh, of, uh, of the Eurozone. Uh, it is a hot topic, uh, obviously, and as we all know, uh, opinions differ uh, when it comes to pros and cons uh, of the common uh, European currency, and that's why uh, we decided uh, to actually invite a third party, uh, because there are people who think Euro is a blessing in the Czech Republic, but uh, at the same time there's a group of people uh, thinking that uh, it's rather a curse. Uh, so we thought it would be a good idea to invite a third party which will uh, share with us uh, its opinion uh, concerning the current situation and the future of Euro. And uh, I think that uh, we really did a good job because uh, if you look at the individuals sitting uh, on the panel, uh, you can hardly imagine uh, better insiders and movers and shakers when it comes to Euro. So without further ado, uh, I would like to thank you again uh, for coming and I would like to pass the floor to the founder of Prague 20, whose idea it was to organize this panel and who will be acting as a moderator of today's discussion, Mr. Vladimir Lohi. Thanks for coming and enjoy the debate. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and thank you, Radek, for a very nice uh, introduction. Uh, It is my pleasure, after a relatively long break, which nobody else than myself is entirely responsible for, that long break. Uh, so after a long break, allow me to welcome you at another Prague 20 seminar. And as Radek Spitzar has already mentioned, we are very glad and pleased that Aspen Institute of Prague decided to support our activities this year. And I dare to say that uh, we might found the cooperation in the uh, more future as well. We are thanking uh, to uh, Aspen Institute Prague for providing us the support. Without that support, probably we wouldn't be able to organize the meeting, uh, the meeting today. The, it is not only the long break between this meeting and our last meeting, but we are also in the other place. Normally, we are just opposite the square, but there is a graduation ceremony for the students, and that's something which I'm afraid that it's even more important than Europe. The title we have chosen today, Euro, the past and the future, is not about the problems of common currency only. It is about the future of the European integration, about the future of what is called the European dream or European project. And I'm indeed extremely proud having such excellent speakers to the topics here today. Let me start with a bit provocative statement, but not to provoke, but to rather uh, stimulate the discussion. I personally, but a uh, view of one single economist is not important. I personally believe, and I have always believed, that Euro was a premature project and should not have been introduced back in 1999 and changing the coins and banknotes in 2010. I also believe that Albert Euro was not a primary cause of the present economic maladies in many countries on our continent. It has contributed to the depth and lengths of the present recession. Low interest rates allowed for the capital flows to the periphery, financing profligacy, asset bubbles, unjustified wage increases, and leading to the huge gap in competitiveness. I also personally believe that alignment and competitiveness differences is a primary task for the Eurozone policymakers today. This alignment can't be achieved by internal depreciations due to the political infeasibility. Nobody can imagine a further drop of wages and prices in Greece or elsewhere in the periphery. And the only way I see is to inflate northern economies through stronger economic growth and wage and price increases there. To this end, capital needs to flow from south to the north. Today, this is true for the private capital. But thanks to ECB OMT policy, 
we see public capital still flowing in the opposite direction to the south, as witnessed by present target two balances. The whatever it takes statement of ECB President Draghi last summer definitely helped to placate the markets at that time and probably was very important. But again, and this is my own personal view only, its continuation, I believe, is controversial. But this, in a very nutshell presentation of one possible view of the present Euro crisis, is only, as I said, a view of one single economist. And there is a whole plethora of interpretations and explanations. And also, I'd like to be well understood. I very highly appreciate the noble achievements of post-war economic integration. I want to see Europe strong, competitive, and with growing living standards. Euro is a reality, and it is in the Czech economy, and I would say the whole Czech society interest to see Eurozone stabilized. We, like everybody else in Europe, complain on many European shortcomings, from red tape to excessive or ill-conceived regulation. But on the European scene, we should not be distinguished. We should not distinguish ourselves as Czech Czechs as Czech Republic, by sarcastic criticism only. We should actively cooperate in all areas where we believe it is useful and where we can provide value added. And as a matter of fact, this is exactly happening. Maybe it's not to be, to be seen so much, but uh, it is happening, be it on the level of the state administration, be it on the level of central bank and other bodies. But we should also closely follow how Eurozone after achieving short-term stabilization, and let me repeat, I strongly believe that it is in our interest to see Eurozone stabilized, uh, that we should also closely follow how Eurozone intends to proceed in strengthening institutional and political framework, not only for more efficient performance of common currency, but for ultimate goal of whole integration process, well-being of the European citizens, and place in today's world that Europe deserves given its history, culture, and entrepreneurial spirit. Here some of us are reserved, not to say skeptical, but the only way forward is to listen to each other. And that brings me to our first speaker. I'm extremely pleased that President Trichet has accepted the invitation of Prague 20 and, um, and Aspen Institute to come to speak. Very few people know what is the original education of President Trichet. He's a minor. He studied, uh, I have it something here, L'Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Mines de Nancy. Uh, but he also graduated from the two star French University Sciences Po and Ecole Nationale d'Administration. Jean Claude served in the offices of President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing and also as the uh, chef de cabinet of uh, Edouard Balladier when he was a uh, minister of finance. Between 1997 and 1993, uh, he was a, a treasury director or director at the French treasury. And since 1993, he has become to be a governor of the Banque de France. And since June 2003, uh, sorry, since November 2003, uh, as we all already remember, he succeeded in Duisenberg and he became to be the president of the European Central Bank. And he navigated the European Central Bank uh, through really a very stormy waters. After leaving the position of the ECB president, being succeeded by Mario Draghi, uh, President Trichet is member of the board of EADC. He is also the chairman of Broichel, and again, I'm very glad that Prague 20, after Mario Monti and Leszek Balcerowicz, has another chairman of Broichel speaking, speaking to us. And among other things, uh, Jean-Claude is the uh, chairman of the European leg of the Trilateral Commission, where I have a pleasure to be his vice chairman. Jean-Claude, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your invitation, uh, Vladimir. Uh, as you, you know, it's a great pleasure for me to, to work very closely with you in this uh, position of uh, 
having the responsibility together of the uh, chair of the Trilateral Commission. I have also to say that uh, to be here with Marek and Zdeneke is absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> I have the sentiment that uh, we are back to the period where we were working together uh, extremely closely, and uh, it's, again, a great, great pleasure for me. Uh, I am um, impressed by uh, the audience, uh, and I know that I am in a, in a country which is discussing a lot, which has a dedication for uh, weighing the pros and cons, the positives and the negatives. And uh, I uh, know also that uh, the rule of the game is that you have to respond to a lot of uh, very uh, incisive and, uh, and uh, I would say, uh, as direct as possible questions. So I will try to stick to the main points of my uh, message today. I heard uh, what Vladimir said a moment ago on, on the timing. Timing, not necessarily the best one. It reminds me the story of the two uh, British businessmen that were in Scotland in a very remote area. So they uh, want to be aware of what's going on uh, in the world, uh, financial affairs, and uh, so they, they go in, uh, in a small shop selling uh, papers, and they say, well, Madame, uh, could, could you, could you uh, give us uh, the Financial Times? And the lady curiously says, uh, do you want today Financial Times, gentlemen, or yesterday Financial Times? And they respond, well, uh, today financial time is perfectly okay. And she says, well, if you want today financial time, why don't you come back tomorrow? <laughs> so timing is, <laughs> of course, of the, uh, always of the essence. Let me uh, take my first point. I will have the nature of the crisis. Uh, I will have uh, a comment on the three episodes that I see in the present crisis that we are experiencing at a global level. And then I will try to respond to the question, why is it that the European have been and uh, are still at the epicenter of the third episode of the crisis? And then I will conclude on the, uh, I would say, repair of uh, the weaknesses that explain that we were the epicenter and we are the epicenter of the uh, crisis. For me, the nature of the crisis is that it is a crisis of the advanced economy. So, of course, we concentrate on Europe, uh, even on Euro, but we have to have the big perspective. Uh, as you know, the crisis uh, uh, started uh, in the United States of America. It was the worst financial crisis since World War II. Could have been the worst financial crisis since World War I, had we not reacted, we central bankers, and uh, uh, governments very boldly and swiftly. Uh, the uh, amplitude of what has been done by the central bank in the heat of the crisis and what has been done by the government is currently underestimated, particularly what has been done by government. We avoided a great depression <laughs> in embarking on extraordinary bold measures and extraordinary demanding measures in terms of involvement of the taxpayer. The crisis of the advanced economy, which is a global crisis in my own reading, had three episodes. A first episode from the uh, subprime crisis up to Lehman Brothers, say mid-07, mid-September 08. During that period of time, we had financial turbulences, a number of major difficulties that appeared uh, on the markets. The first intervention of the European Central Bank uh, on the non-conventional mode, the 9th of August uh, 2007, with illimited supply of liquidity at fixed rate. And uh, we you might remember that we were asked 95 billion euros, which was an enormous amount of liquidity. It was the start for the central banks and the money market uh, that, uh, uh, that we are directly in contact with. It was the start of these financial turbulences. Went up to Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers uh, is the start of the second episode where we had an immediate and grave threat of collapse of the financial system of the advanced economy. Not of the emerging economy, of the advanced economy. This. Uh, 
uh, called for the reaction I mentioned and the very bold and swift reaction. And then we went up to N of O9. N of O9, we could see that we had avoided the Great Depression and that we were in a situation where it was clear that uh, uh, the derivatives of the real economy were going better. And uh, so we could see that uh, we had avoided the main danger. We had, of course, uh, the sad experience of a great, de of a great rece recession, not a great depression, but a great recession. And we were rebouncing, uh, I would say, slowly. Then started the third episode of the crisis. Instead of concentrating on the private sector signature, the uh, uh, investors and savers of the world concentrated on the public signature, on the treasuries themselves, on the fiscal position. And uh, this is still the episode where, uh, that we are experiencing. It's not only a European problem. You know that in the United States of America, the fiscal policy is the major issue strategically from the uh, fiscal and economic standpoint. In the UK, you can see to which extent, of course, the new government took decisions that were extremely uh, bold from the standpoint of the fiscal policy and are disputed, by the way. And in, in Japan, everybody knows that Japan uh, has uh, also an enormous problem of debt outstanding. But what characterizes the third episode is that the epicenter of the crisis is in Europe and is more particularly in the euro area. The first episode uh, had an epicenter in the US. It was the subprime. The second episode had an epicenter in the US. It was Lehman Brothers after Burston, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and before, if I may, AIG uh, and other uh, institutions, you name it. It was a global crisis, of course, epicenter in the US. The epicenter crossed the Atlantic at the end of 09, beginning of 10. And the best summing up I have is that when Ben Bernanke, uh, that, uh, we, with whom we had been, of course, in permanent contact during uh, all time, particularly in the crisis, uh, pointed his finger on me, say, saying, now, Jean-Claude, it's your turn. <laughs> and it was really, uh, I would say, summing up the fact that uh, the epicenter had crossed the Atlantic, which I felt, uh, by the way, uh, quite heavily, of course. Uh, now, question, why is it that amongst the advanced economy with a crisis which is the crisis for the advanced economy in general, we were the epicenter, we are the epicenter. And I see very rapidly six reasons. Uh, I will only mention the reasons, uh, of course, and I know that in the question, uh, I'm, I'm sure that I will have some questions on those reasons. First reason, not <laughs> that, uh, Vladimir, in my opinion, we <laughs> started too early <laughs> the euro. First reason, we did not respect the framework that we had, namely the Stability and Growth Pact. I myself and all my colleagues uh, in the euro area, we had said we have no political federation, we have no federal budget, we have a single currency, the quid pro quo is that we must have a very solid framework for fiscal policy. It is not a sufficient condition for everything to go uh, very well, but it's certainly a necessary condition. This was challenged. This was challenged, I have to say sadly, by the major countries in Europe, particularly in 2003 and 2004, by France, my own country, by Germany, and by Italy only to mention uh, those countries, uh, which were adamant to say we don't need such a tight jacket. They were, uh, um, it's not to excuse them, because I think that it's very difficult to forgive that. But nevertheless, I have to say that very curiously, the, uh, I would say, majority of the economists the world over were indeed saying you have a tight jacket, you should not have a tight jacket, uh, you, you need breathing space, uh, why do you have this stability and growth pact? So the major countries in Europe were not respecting the pact, but more or less in line with a benign neglect uh, that was uh, the overwhelming position 
uh, throughout the international community, which, by the way, was incredibly naive in thinking that we wouldn't have in the future cycle, that uh, uh, there was no need for uh, caring for uh, the signature of the public sector and of the treasuries. Even the IMF was called to dismantle its lending wing. This was the message of the international community uh, at, uh, uh, in the years uh, or three or four or five. So first reason, clear enough. Second reason, we didn't have at the time of the setting up of the euro uh, monitoring of the competitive indicators. Since 05, I have to say that my colleagues in the governing council of the ECB, and maybe I can say also in the general council of the ECB, we are thinking that monitoring the evolution of, uni of unit labor cost and of competitive indicators and of external imbalances was something which was very important. I myself circulated every month the evolution of the unit labor cost and also the evolution of a number of nominal indicators like simply the uh, wages and salaries in the public sector, which was decided, which were decided by the ministers of finance themselves. Enormous, enormous uh, differences were observed in, the, uh, uh, in between the various countries. But that did not, uh, was considered at the time as um, uh, something which was dangerous. I don't insist on that, but this is the second very, very important weakness. As important in a single currency area, as important as the fiscal policy monitoring is the competitive indicators monitoring and excessive imbalances monitoring. Third reason, we didn't have a banking union and in the crisis, the correlation between the creditworthiness of the countries and the creditworthiness of the banks appeared to be absolutely decisive in all advanced economy. But inside the euro area, it contributed to stretch even more the euro area because you had a virtuous circle in the countries uh, whose signature was very solid and a vicious circle in the countries uh, whose uh, signature was very weak. And it created, of course, extreme tensions. Uh, I mention uh, this, I know that uh, uh, Marek will, will elaborate uh, much more on that. And then uh, we had a total absence, and this is my fourth reason, my fourth weakness of the euro area explaining why we are the epicenter of the crisis. We didn't have ex ante um, tool to cope with extraordinary circumstances. It was very easy in the United States of America to say, well, we mobilize immediately the federal institution and we am engage in the top uh, uh, program or we engage in any program that can be decided at the center. In the case of the European, we had to invent that. And it, it needed a treaty to invent uh, the European stability mechanism. So you see to which extent, of course, it was difficult to foresee ex ante that we would have to cope with the worst crisis since World War II, but the fact is that we didn't have the tool immediately available. And there are, this is the fourth reason. We have two more reasons that I mention because I trust that they are very important and they are very important for the 17 or tomorrow for the 18, but also for the 27 and for uh, Zdenet and, and, and Marek also very important. Uh, at the level of the 27, we should achieve the single market, we, which we did not achieve. It's a problem for European Union as a whole, and it's a problem particularly for the euro area because it, we need in the euro area a very flexible, achieved single market. And we didn't do the job at the level of the 27, and certainly not at the level of the 17, in the structural reform area. The famous uh, Lisbon agenda, the famous uh, 2020 now, uh, are also issues that are very important and managed uh, at the level of the 27, but particularly important for the 17, because again, the 17 need, in a single currency, a very flexible single market with a single currency. So now I have listed six reasons. Where do we stand? We have reinforced the Stability and Growth Pact considerably. We have agreed upon a fiscal compact, which gives even more clout legally to the Stability and Growth Pact. We have introduced a new pillar, which is called in the jargon of Europe, 
the uh, uh, Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure, MIP. No, you have to read in that uh, SGP, MIP are the two pillars of the European governance, and the MIP, the, f the monitoring of the competitive indicators and the monitoring of the imbalances, in including external imbalances, is extremely important, as important as the SGP. And then we have banking union in progress, and this is extremely important also. And then we have, of course, uh, the new tools that is the European uh, Stability Mechanism. And we have, in principle, an agreement uh, to go actively in the direction of achieving the single market and achieving the structural reform. I say we have in principle because we had that in principle since a long period of time. And if there is a message certainly coming from uh, the observers and from me, if I may, is that this is extraordinarily important, extraordinarily important to be sure that we do all the job that is necessary. Now, will it suffice? What is absolutely clear is that all what has been decided has to be implemented in a very forceful manner that the banking union has to be achieved, not only with a single supervisory mechanism, but also with a single resolution authority, and that, that is extremely important. It is the fact that we have decided all that that explains, in my opinion, why the tail risk of a dismantling of the euro area has been considerably alleviated. This is one of the four reasons I see for that, if I may. For first reason, a lot of improvement in the governance of the euro area has been decided. And this was unthinkable before the crisis. Second uh, reason, we have an adjustment which is proceeding and is uh, not really visible. But if I take the five countries that have been under stress during the crisis, uh, the, uh, uh, I would say, Ireland, Greece, Portugal, Italy, Spain, they had a consolidated current account deficit of 8% of the GDP uh, in 08 or 09. They have now, over the last 12 months, probably 1% of the current account deficit. So it's a considerable improvement, which is visible, of course, from uh, those observers, investors, and savers that look very carefully at what's going, uh, what's going on in Europe. Second reason. Third reason, and it's very important too, all countries decided that they would like to stay in the EU area, or that they would like to have all countries staying in the EU area. From, from that standpoint, a number of decisions have been taken by a number of parliament, including in Germany, and I think that the overwhelming majority in the Bundestag to say, well, we, we agree on helping countries uh, staying uh, with an orderly adjustment in the EU area, particularly Greece, was something which was extremely important because signaling a determination, a strategic determination of the European. Again, it's not only the Bundestag, all other parliament uh, did the same, but it was particularly visible in that case. And the last uh, explanation I have, the fourth, is that the central bank was credible in saying, as far as we are concerned, and provided there is the appropriate conditionality, and provided there is the appropriate commitment of the governments, individually for those who have problems, and collectively for the euro area as a whole, we can step in because it's in line with our monetary policy responsibility to be sure that uh, the monetary policy transmission channel are functioning. So I let you there. I would only as a conclusion say that we have to go even further, in my opinion. We improved a lot the overall governance of, uh, of Europe. In improving this governance considerably, with, I have to say, also two new treaties during that period of crisis, we engage considerably in the direction of political union, because you know the budget is very political. Uh, the, the macro policy are very political. And th that we need now is to go further in the direction of a 
democracy, democratically accountable union. And uh, that's the reason why I trust it's, it's time certainly to reflect on what will be the future step which will probably call for, uh, uh, I would say, a democratically accountable, which clearly says that the European Parliament has to play, and perhaps national parliaments together, have to play a more important role. Because again, we went very far in the direction of the political union, but the democratic accountability is still to be, to be there. And of course, democratic accountability is absolutely decisive to give authority to the economic and fiscal union which is in the making. But as you know, I am confident in Europe. I think we have good reason to be confident. I also want only, uh, in conclusion, to mention the fact that, as you could see during all that period, the euro as a currency has delivered what it was asked to deliver. Stability, no deflation, no inflationary risk materializing, both protected by, I would say, a solid anchoring of, uh, of the uh, price stability at a level which we had given ex ante, less than two, very close to two. And uh, that being said, uh, a currency which during the worst crisis since World War II remain constantly credible. So that when you hear the, uh, the euro will collapse and so forth, it's not true. It's not true. You look uh, at the facts and the figures. What is true is the euro area governance, fiscal and economic governance, was very poor and had to be considerably improved. That is true. And that, that is, uh, uh, of course, the major, major conclusion that we can draw from the crisis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Claude. Definitely, there might be differences of opinion, but I would like to make one personal comment uh, which leads to the high appreciation uh, of your step and the institution you were heading. And that comes me to your first point description of the three periods of the upcoming crisis. In July 2007, I was in, on holiday in Madeira. Imagine the happy morning, fat, self-confident, golden-sized guy lying on the shore of the sea with my wife sipping morning coffee and reading Financial Times, today's Financial Times. And I learned suddenly there is a crisis. What was the German bank, AKW or something like that, or which was the first bank. It was not an American. It was the first, first bank which went bust was, was German. And something started lying by the sea, work in my brain. And in the next Financial Times, next morning, I learned that it was ECB who immediately started to react, who immediately understood the danger. And you called, if I'm not mistaken, the board, because it was in the height of the summer by teleconference. Well, you remember better than I, I know. And it was the ECB who, at that time, acted extremely strongly, extremely timely, and extremely well. And I, disregarding all differences in opinions, what has been said here, I believe that this is something what was uh, a very proper step at that time. Ladies and gentlemen, let me move to another speaker, Marek Belka. Marek Belka is the Polish professor of economics who studied at the University of Lodz and then had different scholarship at the Columbia University, University of Chicago, and London School of Economics. He became an economics professor in Lodz in 1994. He served as the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance from 1997 to 2002 and then 2001 and two. Then he served uh, as the advisor to Prime Minister of Albania and also as the advisor to JP Morgan for Central and Eastern Europe for a short period. And he was designated by President Kwasniewski to become a Prime Minister and if, I'm not, if I remember it correctly, there was some kind of two-step procedure, but finally you were approved by, by the same 
in June in 2004, and you served as the Polish Polish Prime Minister till the next election. I believe this was a very difficult period, and your government managed to stabilize the situation. <laughs> Later, Marek Belka served as the director of the, of the IMF European Department in Washington, and in May 2010, Marek Belka was nominated as the president of National Bank of Poland, to which he is today. And again, one personal opinion, I met Marek many, many times, but probably the most bizarre and also interesting meeting is that we met in Baghdad a couple of months after uh, toppling uh, Saddam Hussein in September 2003, and Marek Belka was an important part of the interim administration in that period in Iraq. Maybe today it does not seem to be a big distinction, but I uh, would like to appreciate two things. I spent only two days there, and the work that Marek was doing was excellent. And second, it also some, say something about personal courage of Marek Belka. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with my friend, the governor of National Bank of Poland. Well, thank you, Lado, uh, <coughs> for inviting me to this uh, very prominent panel. Uh, I will say something which is complementary to what uh, Jean-Claude uh, had to say, and mostly where I feel at home is to give uh, the perspective of a non-Eurozone country uh, on most uh, topical issues of today, which is the banking union. Uh, but mostly it will be Polish perspective because uh, when I reflected on uh, the differences between such non-Eurozone countries as, say, UK, Sweden, Czech Republic, and Poland, there are very few similarities and very uh, different, um, very, very big differences. Uh, Vlado uh, was uh, caught by surprise, uh, by surprise in Madeira. Mm, I remember uh, just one week before the fall of Lehman Brothers, uh, the Polish Prime Minister proudly announced that Poland is going to join the Euro in 2011 or 12, at, le at last. Well, he must have been caught by surprise too. Uh, the topic of my talk that I announced to, uh, to the organizers was um, sort of remarks from the periphery. And this does not sound to be uh, overly provocative for you, but uh, if I said this in Poland, this is clearly a provocation. Um, because, uh, well, one thing that we hate to be is in the periphery. I mean, you don't understand this because you have never been in the periphery. We have always been in the periphery. And uh, that, is, uh, that is a problem for us, to avoid being in the periphery. So uh, when we look at the euro, when we look at the banking union, which I'm going to concentrate in this talk, uh, the political consideration that is always present in the debates in Poland is geopolitical. How to avoid being in, in the periphery, not in the inner circle. And we see uh, that the European integration is now clearly uh, going into two-speed or multi-speed uh, Model, model, and of course we we don't like it. I add that if I uh, have if I have to choose between uh, Europe of many speeds and Europe without any speed, then I choose then I choose the first. So I'd rather have a Euro Europe and you uh, and European economy, European integration of many speeds and alive and kicking and being attractive to the whole world rather than being stagnant. So uh, we are very much keeping fingers crossed for the, uh, for the success of this uh, 
reconstruction of the European integration, because this is more than just a reconstruction of the Eurozone or construction of institutional uh, foundation for Euro, because of larger good. We believe that uh, if things go wrong, uh, the whole European project may, uh, may go wrong. The, the biggest uh, achievement of uh, Europe, which is a uh, common market, not only for uh, goods, but uh, increasingly for services, people, capital, may, may become fractured. So now, uh, let me uh, turn to the, uh, to the main issue that I want to elaborate on is the banking union. The banking union, uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, what you probably all know, how important it is and how indispensable it is uh, in view of euro on one hand and very deep financial integration of, of the continent on the other. Um, you cannot have banking union. If only for the following reason that I think is not, is not mentioned too, too frequently. Once we decided, we in Europe decided for financial integration, buttressed by Euro. Uh, European banks uh, forgot that they had a country of origin. They decided, okay, our homeland is Europe, Europe. We are, or we are bound to be pan-European. Some of them actively uh, trying to become pan-European. Very few success, succeeding, but still, it's like in the US, uh, no American bank, although they should, it treat uh, an individual state as its, uh, as its home. It's American economy that you compare the size of banks and the banking sector with. S the, same, the same idea, the same concept developed in the European banking sector. The banks thought and had the reasons to believe that their homeland is Europe or Euro as the currency, which proved to be wrong for many. So now we have to make up for deficiencies and banking union <laughs> is the obvious solution to uh, amend, to, to repair this sort of imbalance between the full integration full financial integration, purported at least, and still uh, national fragmentation of, uh, of the banking sector and, well, the banking sector. So now, what is the Polish approach to the banking union? Well, there are two reasons we should be absolutely enthusiastic about the banking union. And it's on top of the fact that banking union is indispensable for the euro, for the euro survival, for the euro stabilization. It's one that 65% of the Polish banking sector is dominated by uh, foreign, mostly European uh, financial groups, which means that if the banking union comes into being, well, those banks will be indirectly at least in a banking union anywhere. So we are, we should be, and we, we, we should be enthusiastic about Polish participation in the banking union. And the second thing is that Poland is, contrary to the Czech Republic, a structural importer of capital. And we are vitally interested in capital flows to be smooth, to be efficient, uh, and inexpensive. So there are good reasons for Poles to be, and for Polish elites, for Polish economic community, banking community, to be fully behind the idea of banking union and Polish membership in the banking union. Well, but we are not so enthusiastic, in fact. So the question is why? What are the, the, the 
awkward questions that we are asking others and asking ourselves mainly. Well, maybe first, we, we don't see that enthusiasm in, in Europe, generally. I mean, this is so much of a, of a difficulty to build up the, the, the banking union that, that questions arise uh, within the Eurozone countries, within the Eurozone countries' leaders. It's, it's about the, uh, the burden sharing, in fact. It's the division of, of, of competences between the center and the, and the national authorities, uh, timeline, coverage, all kinds of problems. And of course, uh, I mean, this is understandable. It's such a difficult, difficult project that obviously, uh, uh, even if people think and, and are deeply convinced it is, indispensable, then political interests kick in and, and we are sort of navigating from one uh, election uh, date to another election date and, and look for windows of opportunity for the, for the leaders to agree on further steps. But the questions that we are asking ourselves are many, but let me just give you the flavor of those questions and some examples. <clears throat> well, when we, when we think of uh, banking union, we, we think mostly of the SSM, the single supervision mechanism or supervisory mechanism, and single resolution mechanism or authority. Whatever. I mean, these are the two main pillars with uh, deposit insurance being probably I, I, I don't have a view whether, uh, whether this is correct or not, but it is, it is sort of in the, second, uh, in the second priority or so. At, at least in the timeline, it's, it's a little bit behind. Well, then, the question that we ask ourselves is, shall we be better off in the SSM and the SRM, single resolution mechanism? with our banks pooled into the whole European pot because our banks are so diff different from what has grown out of, Euro of typical big European banks. Polish banks, as the Czech banks, are small. Uh, traditional, with a very conservative risk profile of their assets. Uh, you can say, luckily, backward banks. I mean, this is probably something that c the, the world would like to have uh, worldwide. Banking systems like we have, we tracks, we pose. Well, then these banks will be treated as parts of, uh, of big uh, financial groups, financial European groups, which are different, uh, which are very big, which are very complex, uh, which have uh, developed uh, so much that other parts of financial system remains underdeveloped in Europe say compared to the US, and I'm disregarding the, the historical reasons for this. So will, will the banks, the Polish banks, the Polish banks or the Polish subsidiaries and Polish branches of foreign banks be treated properly in time of crisis especially? Well, this is a legitimate question. Well, so far we have been very happy with, the, uh, with foreign investors in the banking sector. Uh, they have behaved like very good sort of corporate citizens. However, we have some problems. One problem is that 
a number of those banks are in precarious position. Uh, for this, okay, I can use the name because it's gone already, uh, Allied Irish Bank, once a champion of, uh, of, uh, of dynamism in the banking sector, is uh, on, a, on a drip feeding. Um, well, I, I will stop short, but there are some other examples of banks that are in poor shape. And we suddenly find ourselves in Poland in a situation where subsidiaries of those banks are for sale. Nothing wrong, but in state, but brings instability. Well, some of the great banks we have in Poland present come from the countries which are not in so great a shape. And here I will not mention the names of those countries. And also, we have the experience of exuberant growth, of the pre-crisis exuberant growth, which in Poland manifested itself in one form only, which is the wave of foreign exchange uh, denominated mortgage loans. Uh, you know about Hungary, uh, I mean, what kind of a challenge did it pose to the government, uh, to the whole economy? We were a little bit luckier, uh, maybe a little bit smarter, uh, but still, uh, the problem exists and, uh, and, and, and is like a memento uh, of what may go wrong if you don't have a very strict supervision or if the mindset, the general mindset is against tough supervision but for light touch supervision. I mean, the, the extreme cases are the Baltic states where, where banks uh, are Scandinavian, uh, they behaved entirely rationally from their individual point of view and they toppled the countries, all three of them basically. Well, not with final success, unfortunately, but, uh, but it's basically due to the, uh, uh, to the uh, strengths of those three societies. So, the, 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 the question that we are asking ourselves Will those banks uh, be treated uh, on a market, market base, uh, in a market-based way? Uh, will they be treated fairly if, if the parents go under? Well, the next question, well, okay, I, I could say, will the single supervisor and the single resolution uh, authority be equally concerned with those branches, which happen to be systemically important for countries like Poland, uh, but are completely unimportant for, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for those huge banks? PKO SA, which is the second bank in Poland, accounts for 3.5% of the balance, consolidated balance sheet of Unicredit. And it brings half of net profit. Thank you very much. So uh, the next thing that we are concerned about, that we are asking ourselves, and I'm closing my, my statement, is the status of macroprudential policies. Uh, we think that, and, and, and the experience shows that imbalances do not only show up on a regional, on a global uh, level, but also nationally or sub-regionally in, in two neighboring countries. But as we have recently um, realized in Europe, they show up in certain sectors, like in shipyard. I mean, suddenly, it's, it's already, I mean, Jean-Claude the, the, the already left ESRB, but we recently had a problem whether we should not look at certain, uh, certain sectors, industrial sectors like shipyard, uh, shipyards, uh, shipyard, shipbuilding industry that, that pose a systemic problem for, for banking industry in certain countries. Well, if this is so, then, then you have to have macroprudential instruments being at hand of national authorities who know better where those imbalances show up. And 
Of course, we need uh, pan-European um, coordination, ESRB. We need uh, uh, probably prior prioritization because some of those are much less important than others, and we don't. We should we should we should choose which imbalances to tackle first. Uh, but we are bound to have spillovers from one country to another. Well, one most flagrant spillover that happened recently and was completely overlooked was a spillover from Greece to Cyprus. Well, so you have to, you, you, you have macroprudential instruments in national hands. And we know now that SSM will also be macroprudential body. This is very handy. And the Czech National Bank is a very good example that if you are a microprudential supervisor, so you, you control banks, let's say, you supervise and regular banks, then you basically don't really need a macroprudential body. Because you can use microprudential instruments for macroprudential uh, purposes. Well, but it's not the case in Europe, because you have 28 now, as of next week or so, 28 members with 28 national authorities. So uh, the questions that we are asking about the future SSM is what is going to be the status of macroprudential policies? What will be the, the link or the, the relation between SSM and ESRB? So these are basically the questions, and many more, that we are asking ourselves not to, to be better prepared, so to say, to make a, 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 a good decision. Thank you very much. I will stop short here. Yes. Thank you very much, Marek. I think in a very informal way, especially in the second part of your presentation, you excellently described the pitfalls and also potential positives of banking union. And thank you very much for expressing the way which I wouldn't call from periphery. I would just call it a view from a group of countries who came through a certain type of a transition from a centrally planned economy to the, to the uh, present situation when the, when the uh, banking sector developed again in a certain way with a, a huge participation of the foreign, ba foreign banks where the local banks are mostly subsidiaries in a different functional forms of the mother banks which are uh, basically rooted in Western Europe in today's Eurozone countries. Ladies and gentlemen, let me move to our third speaker, which is a domestic Czech speaker. I'm very glad that Zdeněk Tuma accepted our invitation. Zdeněk studied at Prague School of Economics. Then he was my younger colleague in the, uh, the Institute of Forecasting, Prognostický ústav uh, in the Academy of Sciences uh, before 1989. Um, after that, he started also his academic career. He was teaching and he's co-author of uh, even a textbook on macroeconomics. Then he served as an advisor to Czech Minister of Industry and Trade, which happened to be myself. And then he left my advisory body to the private financial sector. Then, if I'm not mistaken, he served uh, in a high-level position at EBRD. And in 1999, and correct me if I'm wrong, Zdenek has been named the vice governor of the Czech National Bank and in 2010 becoming the, the governor. He resigned in 2010 and for the moment he again works in the private sector as the advisor of KPMG in Czech Republic and I believe also in Central Europe. Zdenek, once again, thank you for accepting and the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Vladimir, thank you very much for the invitation and for your
kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me and honor to be on the panel with my former colleague Jean-Claude and, uh, and Marek. Uh, in fact, uh, it's for the second time when uh, Vladimir and the Prague 20 organize uh, a discussion on Euro. It was almost four years ago when we had Otmar Ising here in Prague. Uh, so when uh, Vladimir turned to me uh, and asked whether I, I would uh, speak here, I was asking myself, well, what, what's new I can deliver <laughs> regarding Euro? Euro? Obviously, it's uh, not a completely new issue. On the other hand, there are new challenges, and at least there are two uh, important changes uh, in the last four years. The, first of all, uh, it's four years so that we have uh, new facts, uh, new experience, which uh, uh, Euro and Eurozone. Uh, and secondly, and uh, uh, more importantly, uh, we have had the crisis, uh, so it was uh, the real first test of Euro under enormous uh, uh, pressure. Uh, so hopefully I would focus on uh, some of uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, we uh, face in, in the EU and uh, uh, Eurozone faces. Uh, so unlike last time when I uh, asked, uh, when I uh, posed the question, what's the primary role of Euro and of the monetary policy? And I said, well, the primary uh, role of the monetary policy is to deliver price stability. So I was focusing on, on that aspect, but the, the domestic monetary policy uh, in the Czech economy, uh, whether, uh, whether it delivers the, the price stability, and I, I was comparing it with, uh, with the uh, Eurozone. So it was purely uh, economic um, uh, focus on, on that. My conclusion was that uh, the Czech National Bank was delivering the price stability, so its role was stabilizing. Uh, obviously, in case if a country uh, doesn't have a stabilizing monetary policy, it's more advantageous to import it from outside, in other way, uh, to fix the exchange rate or to adopt euro or something like that. So it was very, very much uh, uh, economist point of view. Today, I would like to uh, speak about something slightly different, about the expectations and about, uh, uh, about uh, you know, uh, whether expectations are realistic or, or not. Um, and I, it, it seems to me that some unrealistic expectations uh, at the launch of Euro uh, uh, led to, uh, to some problems per se. So in other words, that it can be uh, counterproductive. Uh, so uh, in, from this point of view, we can speak about some myth about Euro, because some people believe at the beginning that Euro can contribute to the real convergence, uh, that it can increase the inter-regional trade, uh, it can deliver price stability, and certainly in this, in this, uh, in this respect I would uh, fully agree. So let me uh, focus first of all on that aspect of the real, uh, real convergence. Um, when we look at the figures, uh, we uh, can see that in the last 10-15 uh, years, the Eurozone uh, countries uh, have been growing in general. Uh, but on the other hand, we can hardly find any uh, convergence regarding, uh, regarding uh, economic growth uh, among these countries. When we compare that uh, growth with other uh, developed countries like the OECD group, uh, we, wouldn't ha we wouldn't find uh, significant differences. For me, this is not surprising. This is something what uh, should be expected because the choice of the, uh, about the monetary policy framework can hardly deliver uh, uh, higher economic growth. The monetary policy, the monetary policy framework, uh, can uh, cannot influence the structural issues, cannot resolve structural problems of, of the economies. Obviously, you can make mistakes uh, uh, with the monetary policy, and then it can have an impact on the real variables. But otherwise, the choice of the monetary policy regime is much more about the volatility of inflation and uh, the real variables rather than increasing uh, the uh, economic uh, performance. So if some countries were growing faster, like it was the case of the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, it was primarily from, uh, due to other reasons like some fundamental factors. 
and these countries were in the process of catching up. Uh, so this is what we call the real convergence. But they were catching up uh, due to uh, high competitiveness, uh, skilled uh, labor force, and still relatively, che relatively cheap at that time, and other, other reasons. Obviously, this is the challenge for our countries for the future, that uh, there is still that potential to catch up at such pace as uh, we were uh, uh, as, we, as we were catching up in the previous decade. I would be a bit skeptical about the Czech, uh, Czech economy at this moment, but this is beyond the scope of, uh, today's, of my today's remarks. Uh, another extremely important aspect and expectations um, regarding uh, foreign trade, or it's, uh, pro we should not call it foreign trade today, but let's call it intra-regional trade, because it means the trade within the Eurozone. Uh, it was quite an uh, important argument, which was used also by the IMF, for instance, in their, in their study many, many years ago, because it was one of points uh, which made some sense. The argument was, well, Euro can contribute to a higher interregional trade, and because we know that there's a correlation between the, uh, the, the, the foreign trade or interregional trade and economic growth, it couldn't contribute to the economic growth. The problem is that uh, we know that there's a correlation, but we, we are less sure about the causality, but the, you know, the, uh, the growth, uh, the economic growth or the economic performance uh, uh, contributes to a higher trade or whether the higher trade contributes to the economic performance. So it's, it's uh, certainly these variables are correlated. So what's, um, uh, uh, how, how the facts lo look like, uh, so that looking back in the, in the last 10, 10 years, we can see that there's a moderate growth uh, both in uh, Euro area and uh, EU as the whole regarding when we, uh, in terms of the share of uh, trade uh, to, uh, to GDP. Nevertheless, that growth we can observe also in other regions, so that's, uh, this is, uh, it would be difficult to attribute it uh, purely to the effect of uh, Euro. And that growth is not, not substantial, so that probably this was also uh, another uh, expectation which uh, uh, was not uh, realistic, so that I don't think, well, we will see still, uh, we should take into account that these trends uh, uh, take time and that uh, you know, thoughtful evaluation can uh, come in the horizon of 10 or 20 years. Nevertheless, 10 years is already, or 10 years plus is already a sufficiently long period. And until now, in my opinion, we haven't found the evidence that uh, increasing uh, a moderate increase in inter-regional trade would contribute to the uh, economic uh, growth. Uh, then, uh, once again, another remark to the uh, convergence. Uh, obviously, Euro contributed to better uh, transparency regarding uh, prices across, uh, across uh, the, uh, the Eurozone. Uh, so it was believed, uh, and there were some expectations, that this price transparency could lead to uh, uh, some convergence of uh, relative price levels. In some sense, it uh, has happened, but still uh, the differences across price, uh, across countries uh, in terms of price levels persist. Uh, and obviously there are other factors at the national level, so that Euro probably uh, contributed in this respect, but uh, can hardly overweigh uh, those fundamental uh, factors at the national level. Uh, certainly, uh, the con uh, once again, the, there were other factors when we take into account countries like uh, Poland, the Czech Republic, so there, are, there were other factors contributing to the convergence, both in terms of the price level, so that looking at the real effective exchange rate, uh, we can see that in these countries, which were catching up, the convergence was relatively fast, but uh, the evidence within the group of the Eurozone is much, uh, much weaker. Speaking about the, uh, the intra-regional trade, there is another important aspect and one of the most challenging in this, uh, in this moment and in the, in the coming future. And uh, these are internal imbalances. Uh, looking at the position of the euro area as the whole, we can see that it's relatively balanced vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the rest of, of the world. 
Uh, so there are moderate uh, surpluses or deficits uh, regarding the, the foreign trade as a percentage of GDP. But the problem is that uh, significant imbalances persist inside. And this is, uh, this is one of uh, problems which uh, became much more visible uh, during the crisis, despite the fact that it wasn't unknown uh, before the crisis. What I mean that uh, some countries, um, typically we speak about Germany, but it's not only Germany, some countries are systematically in surplus and some, some countries uh, in, in deficit. So it means that, uh, or it indicates that some country seems to be more competitive as compared to others. And it also implies that, there, that there it must be financed somehow. So, it leads to uh, systematic transfers of savings from one part of Europe or from some countries to, uh, to other countries. Uh, the adjustment uh, can be quite abrupt, as we uh, see in Greece and uh, other countries in this, in this area. And, it, th and that's one of my uh, messages uh, today, that, uh, that Unrealistic expectations at the beginning uh, of, uh, of, of Euro might have contributed to this problem uh, because uh, decision makers at the national level, and it was also mentioned by Jean-Claude Trichet, underestimated the, uh, the necessity of structural changes within the economy. And when they entered the Eurozone, they probably felt to be in the safe haven and the pressure on, uh, on uh, policy changes inside uh, uh, was much, uh, much lower. Unfortunately, also financial markets uh, uh, were under this illusion. And I can, con uh, I can mention a uh, very, uh, you know, uh, f for us, a uh, good example of uh, the Czech Republic and, and Slovakia. Because we were going together, and for instance, when we look, uh, when we illustrate this point, in terms of uh, uh, interest rates in, in fi uh, at financial markets. So in the past, you know, these economies were interrelated. Obviously, there are some structural differences, but uh, we are very, very close to each other. Uh, typically, the Czech economy in the past, the Czech Republic has slightly lower uh, interest rates in financial markets than, than Slovakia. Then Slovakia announced uh, uh, joining uh, uh, the Eurozone. And immediately, interest rates started to go down. And in fact, the, they uh, broke the level of, uh, of the Czech economy. But it didn't happen anything with those economies. Fundamentally, those economies were almost the same. So it was some kind of the illusion, a relatively moderate one, because the differences between the Czech Republic and, so and Slovakia were not dramatic. But those changes were much more dramatic in other countries, because before entering the Eurozone, countries like uh, Greece, Portugal, they had uh, signif significantly higher interest rates uh, as compared to primarily German bonds. And after joining the Eurozone, they went down. It, uh, the situation and the debt service was much easier uh, as compared to the past, and the pressure on domestic authorities was much, uh, much less. Uh, so uh, somehow, uh, even uh, experts in financial markets mix together, in my opinion, two points. One is the monetary policy, and the second is that there are some fundamental factors regarding the competitiveness, regarding the performance, regarding the uh, fiscal sustainability. And uh, this is uh, not un in unrelated completely, nevertheless still, uh, still relatively separated. So that the public finance uh, sustainability was one of those uh, areas which uh, became quite acute during, uh, during the crisis. And my uh, last point uh, regards uh, that, uh, that area of the uh, price stability. So in this respect, Euro uh, was uh, certainly successful. In fact, it managed to, uh, to maintain or to transfer that credibility of more credible countries uh, uh, to uh, the region as the whole. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we observed a similar development in uh, other areas as well, so that the previous decade or previous 15 years was the period when central banks, banks were quite successful around the world, so that the stabilization of inflation happened also in other countries, not only in uh, in uh, Eurozone uh, area. It was also the case of uh, other 
EU countries, but also uh, other countries around, around the world. So certainly in this respect, the, the ECB has been uh, uh, successful, uh, but it's quite difficult to say that we can attribute it to, to Euro uh, only. So um, perhaps let me conclude that, uh, uh, that there are, you know, it's, it's clear from the very beginning that there are two important aspects of, uh, of that uh, uh, process of economic in integration of, let's say, Euro. Uh, that Euro has the, the economic and political aspect. Purely from the economic point of view, uh, I believe that uh, it's, um, that the expectations and the hopes uh, were higher at the beginning and that we cannot expect too much. It's still a, a monetary policy framework. It's some kind of the fixed exchange rate, uh, which can bring some advantages, but we can hardly expect uh, improvements uh, regarding the real performance of the economy or fundamental structural fundamental changes. On the contrary, Analytic uh, expectations could have contributed to some problems we, uh, we, we observe today. And the second aspect is the political one. It's part of the political and economic integration of, uh, of, uh, of Europe. And in this respect, I believe that uh, still the project would, uh, would continue. But once again, it depends very much on the political will. So that from this point of view, a uh, very important area, which is the fiscal policy and the fis fiscal sustainability, on the one hand, somehow related to the whole Euro project, but it depends very much on the national political will. So that from this point of view, I'm a bit skeptical about super national schemes. I don't think that one, uh, that single fiscal policy would resolve the problem. Still, we need the discipline at the national level and it will not change in the coming future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denik. Well, I think excellently structured two conclusions were quite clear and the, the message is clear as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Prague 20 and Aspen Institute tried hard to prepare well uh, this meeting. Unfortunately, we do not have our divine relations so developed so that we cannot control the weather. It's extremely hot in Prague despite the fact uh, to, to Jean-Claude and to Marek. Prague yesterday was much worse, so it is still okay today. Uh, we had a storm overnight. Uh, but still it's very hot, but thank you very much for all to, to all the uh, speakers, and also I saw quite a lot of attention in the, in the audience. Uh, nevertheless, I'm opening the discussion. I would like to ask you all to be, uh, to be short at up to the point, and basically to raise the questions. Please uh, be so kind and introduce yourself. Yeah, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Adel. Uh, I have a question um, concerning the rebalancing of the ECB sheet um, after the obviously illimited um, purchase of big state uh, debt. Yeah. Um, is the perspective another bad bank? Or do you count on, uh, on fresh equity delivered by the nations such as France and uh, Germany? Thank you. Would you be so kind to introduce yourself, please? My name is Chris Adal. And you are from any institution? Or? No, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm okay. a painter. Very good. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that suffices. And, 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 and I got interested in economic Thank issues. Thank you very much for, for coming. Yes. Now, this is for the reasons that uh, there are the representatives of media in this room. And uh, we just would like to know the affiliation. Please do understand that. And I'm, I'm definitely extremely pleased that the artists find a way to this panel. <laughs> and may, maybe one remark not entirely related only to this question. Jean-Claude Trichet is not ECB president anymore.
Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, I indeed, I will, uh, I will give you my personal understanding, but uh, as you know, this is something which has been decided by the Governing Council when I was not there. When I was there, we decided uh, uh, two SMP uh, action, uh, and we purchased both, I would say, private uh, securities and uh, public tradable securities uh, two times, once in 10 and once in 11. Uh, at both period, we had a very, very important problem for transmitting as correctly as possible our monetary policy uh, to all the euro area. We are responsible in the ECB Governing Council for issuing the currency for 333 million people and for 17 countries. And we have to ensure the stability of the prices according to the treaty for these 335, for the 33 and <laughs> very soon 35 million people. Uh, again, in the crisis, the impact on the some markets, the disruption of some markets, created an immense problem for transmitting monetary policy. I understand the OMT as also a way to ensure that, to help restore a better transmission of the monetary policy with the idea uh, which uh, I uh, understand was the idea of the governing council, that they would eliminate a catastrophic risk, which would be a, a risk of uh, default or a risk of getting out, uh, changing the currency, uh, redenomination, that was considered by the governing council undue what was due, what was normal, would be that you, you would have spreads taking into account the credit worthiness of the various signatures. So you have differences that are fully legitimate. But uh, the idea that you could have the materialization of the tail risk, which would be the explosion of uh, the credit worthiness of the system as a whole, was considered uh, unfair, an undue, say, provided, of course, appropriate conditionality would be pursued, not only in fiscal in the fiscal area, but also in the macro policy area. And uh, uh, it was the case also before, when we en engage in the two SMP procedure, of course it was on the basis of the individual and collective decisions which were taken by the government of Europe. And uh, even in the case of the second decision we took, in August 2011, there were very clear messages which were sent uh, to say, well, uh, we, we cannot alone, of course, uh, uh, solve uh, problems the, if you do not do yourself all what is necessary. And that is, as you might know, exactly the concept which we have in the OMT procedure, which calls for appropriate conditionality to be activated, has not been activated, by the way, but which calls for appropriate conditionality and for appropriate uh, involvement of the governments of the other country as a whole, of the appropriate involvement of the, of the Euro group. Uh, in comparison with all other major central banks, you might know that the balance sheet of the ECB has much less securities. So in that sense, in the sense of your question, less volume of risks. And uh, you might, at least in that form of purchasing securities. And uh, I have to say that uh, the uh, uh, issue of uh, considering the overall risk which is which are taken by the ECB is followed uh, very very carefully I have to say by the uh, governing council it was followed very carefully in my time is followed very carefully now and so on the last question I would say uh, 
that this is, of course, something that the colleagues in the Governing Council are looking at permanently, the kind of risks are which are taken. Thank you. Thank you very much. I saw the gentleman over there as the second, uh, by, by the door, Urvedzi, then Pan. Rokitka, týdenní občanské právo. Chtěl bych se zeptat všech panelistů. My máme tady to potěšení mít tedy prezidenta, který je eurofederalista a bývalý prezident byl euroskeptik nebo eurorealista. A, já to budu překládat konsekutivně. Ano. A um, předtím jsme byli varováni jako občané, že euro nebude fungovat, protože podle Mandela ekonoma to není o, dobrá um, optimální um, měnová zóna. A současný pan prezident... Pan Miloš Zeman je také ekonom a to je tedy, jak jsem říkal, eurofederalista. Ten si myslí, že to nebude fungovat zase z toho důvodu Evropská unie a eurozona, protože to není federální útvar, že tady chybí prostě federální přerozdělování na federální úrovni, jako má třeba Čínská lidová republika nebo Spojené státy americké. A díky tomu není eurozona a Evropská unie vlastně v podstatě dobře ředitelná a konkurenceschopná. Jak to vidíte vy? Aby jsme se nedočkali toho, jako ve Španělsku, že budeme mít 50% nezaměstnané mládeže, což říkal i pan bývalý eurokomisař Špidla, že to je neudržitelná situace na jihu Evropy. Takže děkuji. Um, f first of all, I would say uh, it's history in the making. Europe is one of the uh, continents in the world where you have history in the making. It's absolutely clear that it was an extraordinary historical decision for countries that were at the, t at the time uh, number three GDP in the in the world, number four GDP in the world, number five, number six, and so forth, to decide not only to create a single market, but also to create a single currency area. So first of all, it's very bold. It's history in the making. That uh, some would say uh, you should not. Uh, well, I understand that. And uh, it's... Uh, a question again, which is uh, very much of historical nature. I would also say that for a country to enter into the euro area, a very large consensus of the various sensitivities seems to me something which is very important, personally, because it is a commitment for, you know, uh, of <laughs> eternity, in a way, uh, uh, as, you, as you know, exactly like uh, when you join uh, they joined the, the U.S. Uh, single currency area. Uh, I share th certainly the view that this historical process is not achieved. And as I mentioned, uh, we have to go further. So I will certainly share the view that in a historical long-term perspective, the idea that we have to go further and have a union which is already a very close economic fiscal now that we have reinforced the uh, stability and growth pact and with the fiscal compact and economic union with what all what i said on the macroeconomic imbalance procedure all this has to get full democratic legitimacy and uh, it calls for going forward in the direction of a federation now uh, i have to say that it is clear that a single a continent, which, ha which is a single market with a single currency, doesn't mean that all states are alike, or all participants <laughs> are alike, 
when before the crisis, which has been the worst since World War II. So you can always say, well, the euro area did not react very well in the worst crisis since World War II. But you were speaking, uh, Zdenek, of anticipation. What was the expectation, both of the euro and of the euro area, seen from, say, uh, Washington and New York, uh, in case we would have to cope with the worst crisis ever since World War II? The idea would have been the euro evaporates because uh, it's uh, such a new currency, it's not uh, solid, no creditworthiness and so forth, and the euro area will dissolve. By the way, it was a very firm belief of a number of you know, observers or even market participants. It's not at all what happened. The resilience of the European in the crisis, with all the difficulty they had, has been there. So I, I mentioned that en passant, because it's, it is something which we, we have to fully understand. And my last point would be the following. Uh, the main, the two main mistakes, obviously, were not respecting the framework, the Stability and Growth Pact, which again had been discussed politically in all countries and had been accepted as part of the euro area. So it was very strange that at a certain moment, as I said, uh, the major countries in Europe were abandoning that. And second observation, uh, it's a absolute lesson of this uh, 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 first 14 years of the euro and also of the crisis that you have to monitor the nominal evolution in the euro area. It can be in some countries that the fact that uh, they are losing competitiveness year after year is totally forgotten by uh, the society as a whole, until you have a real uh, difficulty. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that this is, we still have a lot to explain in this domain. It is not fully understood that when you are in a single currency area, if you let your revenue, cost, and national inflation gallop, you are simply losing competitiveness. And then you are creating by your own, I would say, making, unemployment, as you said. Now, when you did that in the past, uh, you have to correct, and, and then, of course, the adjustment must be there. And as I said, the adjustment is proceeding. So uh, we, we, I have to say, I'm impressed myself by what uh, you were mentioning uh, implicitly Spain, by what Spain is doing. Uh, Spain is doing a remarkable adjustment and became competitive again. Uh, so what counts, of course, is the direction. Jean-Claude, would you mind if I elaborate a little bit more and then apologize to those in the room who have heard that from me recently a couple of times. You mentioned the, the US experience and um, after the crisis, uh, especially the Euro crisis, uh, a lot of uh, academic studies uh, of economic historian reminded us about the development of fiscal federalism in the US during the 19th century, uh, especially after the Civil War, after the greenback has been withdrawn from the circulation, going through the bimetallic standard, uh, overwhelming uh, uh, exception of the gold standard, and creating Fed only relatively as late as 1913. So it took one century to the United States to establish a federal setup, and they paid even with one civil war, despite the fact I don't want to claim that a civil war was uh, only because of unified currency. There were many other reasons, definitely. But it took a century to a society which was amalgamated by the common language, common ethos, immigration, homestead, you know, uh, expanding from the coast to the, to the inner land. Uh, something which really uh, created a common American ethos which allowed for building up uh, um, a fiscal, uh, fiscal federalism, which allowed for the smooth functioning of uh, one currency, a US dollar. And my basic question is whether at the beginning of the 21st century, Europe is prepared, whether Europe has such an ethos <coughs> and whether, uh, whether uh, we can speak about a European demos a people. Uh, one of the 
Czech politologics professors at the conference I participated just uh, two weeks ago said that Europe should have some kind of a common story, inception story. I believe such an inception story has the original eight countries, Germany, France, Benelux, and Italy after the war. The big question is whether such a common story has 28 countries after the, uh, Croatia becomes the, the member. And um, I know that we can substitute the non-existence of the demos by many things starting from uh, banking union and finishing by fiscal compact. But is this, is this feasible in the long run? I apologize for a little bit lengthy explanation. But this is what worries me utmost in the present discussion. Uh, can, can I, uh, in one, one second, uh, try to respond to your question? It g you can go in history backward, only at the start of the, uh, I would say, the United States of America. We, we have some memory of that in Europe because it was a war also between the UK and France, in a way, uh, on that continent. You, you can also uh, go back to the discovery of the US by Christopher Columbus. Uh, we had already a uh, French franc when uh, uh, Christopher Columbus set sail. So we, we have a longer history. But we can go up to the Roman Empire. Uh, the Roman Empire was, is one of the various metrics that explain that Europe is something special. Then you had also the Carolingian Empire. I agree with you that it did not cover the full Europe. In the recent period, you had uh, quite a number of wars, if I may. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars, not, not to go backward more. Uh, then uh, you had uh, a, b a big war, which uh, I agree was between a few countries. Then you have a global uh, uh, First World War, and then the Second First World War. So in a way, my interpretation of what the Europeans have decided to do and they just proved that the resilience of their historical project was certainly largely superior to what was foreseen in case they would have to resist to the worst crisis since World War II. Let's, let's remember that. Th this is what we had to cope with. And I can tell you that uh, it was quite difficult, seen from New York, to understand that it was likely that we would hold both as far as the currency was concerned and as far as the uh, euro area was concerned. So uh, it's only, I on, of course, the, <laughs> the truth, <laughs> we will, history will tell us <laughs> what is the real uh, good reading of what's happening. And what I say is to, to offer a counterpoint uh, to, to what you, you just said. And again, this historical discussion, because it's history in the making, is very stimulating. I, I was sure coming in Prague that we would have, you know, <laughs> extraordinary, extraordinary meditation on history. Well, you are just inside many historical buildings here. Marek Belka asked for the word. Well, Jean-Claude may not be a miner by profession anymore, but he's a mine of, uh, of historical... Uh, let's say, facts and opinions and interpretations. Uh, let me um, revert to the initial question. And I guess there were two, two, two dimensions to this question. One, one was about the, um, the Eurozone um, treated as, a, as an imperfect uh, or very imperfect uh, uh, optimal currency area, and the second was about the the views of individuals, of, of uh, um, eminent uh, individuals who may have uh, completely different views on uh, on the same facts, on the same uh, processes. Well, number one, uh, of course, uh, eurozone or Europe is not an optimal currency. In, Area well, so is neither is the U.S. Uh, if we look at the differences between the proud state of Alabama and say not so proud but much better off uh, state of Connecticut, the difference is probably more pronounced than between uh, say Portugal and uh, Holland. Uh, but still, uh, the dollar uh, area works because of 
and everybody in the economic community know, knows uh, because of uh, free movement of labor and because of fiscal union. And these are things that were uh, either imperfect or missing in uh, in the European uh, in the euro area, and now we are building up certain elements of those. Uh, impose, uh, I mean, introducing euro sort of raised the bar uh, against which, uh, or, or or the benchmark against which we we had to measure. Um, uh, the, the the members of the of the eurozone uh, without euro uh, we could have afforded more uh, differences in 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 uh, let's say economic patterns uh, not just competitiveness now with euro we have to unif make it more uniform or closer but that's that's not that's not really and anything interesting for economists. What is interesting is that the process of building up the Eurozone, well, which assumes certain elements of state, of federation, even if we hate to call, call it that way, uh, involves a lot of regulation. Involves, and of course, people who hate regulation hate the idea of Euro. And we both know what we are, what we are having in mind, whom we are having in mind. Um, if we even mention the idea of federation or confederation or, or certain elements of federation, then the people who hate uh, the notion of, of of weakening national identities or who. Uh, uh, exaggerate or amplify uh, artificially cultural differences between parts of, of Europe, then they will hate the idea. Here I have in mind some Polish politicians. So, uh, not, not everything can be explained by, let's say, econ economic arguments uh, or even history. Some people have a certain Weltanschauungen and that's it. And they will always be against uh, certain uh, certain ideas. That's it. Well, without seizing as a moderator, I should not comment very much, but uh, allow me to make three quick comments. The last thing, you are perfectly right. There are people and there are people. But then it's about what I'm calling an existence, and I'm very glad that Jean-Claude mentioned it as well, what, what I would not uh, be afraid to call a kind of a democratic deficit. If you would like to have a federal Europe, you should also allow for a democratic procedure which will also allow everybody to express his view and create a political movements to, to pursue his view. And we do not have it, and especially before the crisis, Europe was inclined only to pursue one, allow me to say a little bit, elitistic position and to openly criticize this position before the crisis was, as I'm always saying, as if to shout a dirty word in the church, something what you don't do in a, in a good society. And uh, on, the, on Alabama, yes, there are culturally big differences within the US, but still there is an ethos. There, there is still there is something which unifies people from Alabama and Connecticut not to question the fiscal transfers when they are needed. While in Europe we still have maybe not so many differences, but people of different countries question fiscal transfers. Uh, the lady over there back, then there was a gentleman, I saw the, re the hand and hear the lady in the first row. We start with the lady in the back, please. And then I will probably close the discussion. We are uh, approaching the limits of, of the weather and, uh, and, and other things. Please, madam. Katarina Šafaříko, a journalist. Um, I, ha I would have a question of follow-up to what you just discussed, which is um, that you all probably know that the Czech debate is pretty much dominated by those saying that the euro as a project is a stupid thing since it's a, it's a sort of a bond, a framework for two civilizations. One is the northern Calvinist, um, very much disciplined. The second one is the southern, um, very much on the expensive side, etc. Um, and my question is, especially to Mr. Belka, since Poland is 
in a, in a way, in a situation like the Czech Republic, it's outside our zone, but sort of a aiming to be inside. My question is, on what you base your sort of confidence that Euro is economically wise and sustainable in decades to come, since it really is sort of a uniting two or maybe three, four different worlds. So what do you base your economic confidence on? Thank you. Well, I have the... Um, we, we, cannot, we cannot compare what we have now with the counterfactual, with the world of um, um, unstable exchange rates undermining, uh, undermining trade, undermining uh, common market. And I believe that this was exactly one of the reasons uh, that uh, the European leaders, not the Czech leaders, not the Polish leaders, we were down in Yakutia uh, with our minds, uh, that it was time to put some order uh, in the exchange rate regime of Europe. Uh, all those uh, econometrical studies that show that introduction of euro didn't really magnify trade flows. Well, obviously, as all econometric studies, they, uh, they overlook the basic idea that if the, uh, um, say, if we had the crisis phenomena like we had, because this this erupted uh, with no link to the existence or non-existence to euro we would have probably wild not wide wild uh, changes wild swifts in uh, exchange rates probably dealing a, a severe blow to uh, to the uh, trade uh, um, integration to 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 the common market in europe we shall never know it. Uh, we shall never be certain about it. But once we decided, we Europeans decided for the Euro, uh, we have to continue and we should, uh, even if we have a clear view on deficiencies, uh, we should not uh, uh, draw a rather idiotic conclusion that coming back to status quo ante is a solution. Uh, does it sound economic or political? It's for you to choose. To be, to be fair, to be fair, if we go to history and we speak about the US in uh, 19th century. We should also uh, remember the situation between 1969, the Werner Report, and the, 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 the 1990, basically the decision, uh, well, the law report, and then the decision to accept Euro. It was a period which Marek described that we were mentally in, down in Yakutia, uh, definitely we didn't follow it that, uh, that close. It was a period of a difficult time in Western Europe, competitive devaluations. Indeed a problem that the present system was not uh, perceived as a stable. And it was completely fair that uh, decision makers, politicians, economists were in search of something. The only, if I go down from this mediation level to the practical level, the only question I have basically is, why the hell did we need Euro exactly in 1999? Why didn't we postpone it for another 20 years? Maybe because of the, of the competitive devaluation, maybe because of the political development after the end of communism, etc. There are many questions to which I do not have an uh, answer. But there is one point where I would uh, agree with Marek, despite the fact that I would probably wouldn't use the word uh, idiotic conclusion. Well, conclusion, yes, I would probably use the word idiotic. <laughs> I sometimes use the term intelligent idiots. <laughs> uh, that it's extremely difficult now to envisage coming to the ex ante status quo. That's, that's obvious. The gentleman over there, please. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, my name is Tomáš Rosák. I'm a general delegate of French company Saint-Gobain for Eastern Europe. Uh, Saint-Gobain is a big French uh, industrial group and great investor in Czech and in Poland as well. I'm stressing it that uh, I'm sorry I'm not the artist. I'm not also not coming from banking sector, I'm coming from industry. One of our Czech big businessmen, Tomáš Baťa, wrote eight years ago that the crisis is coming always if the society is lacking 20,000 brave, courage, well-educated young men and women which are able to establish their own business and giving the job to two million others. Mr. Lohi, Mr. Tuma, Mr. Rusnok very often are pointing out in their articles if the competitiveness of Europe has been increased when accepting Euro. And my question to you, Mr. Trichet, is uh, if, you, if you feel that uh, the today crisis may come also from the fact that in the period between 1999 and 2009, there has not been established enough new entrepreneurs, winning new markets, giving a new businesses, jobs to, to the Europe. Don't you think that, uh, that, uh, that the, one of the reasons why going for Europe, that means boost the business, has not been achieved? Thank you very much. It's a question a little bit beyond the scope of today's uh, panel, but only a little bit, because it has to do with a point which Mr. Tuma stressed, uh, Euro and the real convergence. Is anybody on the panel who would like to answer? Zdenik? The question was, was for me, but Maybe, I don't know whether you, you have yeah, still time or... Please, yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would fully agree. I said myself that uh, one of the reasons why we had big problems were the absence of structural reforms, which means, of course, uh, flexibility in all markets, which means uh, R&D, which means uh, entrepreneurial spirit uh, uh, generalized. So I fully agree with uh, your remark. And I think that this is a remark which is good for all, I would say, the euro area, those who are out of the euro area in Europe, and the rest of the advanced economy. I'm always struck, you know, when you look at what has happened over the last 15 or 20 years, uh, and uh, I'm not uh, sticking particularly to the 14 years since the euro was created, or more than 14 years, you have uh, a very surprising discovery. Growth per capita in the US, in Japan, and in Europe as a whole, is more or less the same. Not very flattering, 1%. So uh, we really have a problem in the advanced economy as a whole. And uh, it seems, it looks like, uh, we all have big problems to cope with the new world in which we are plunged. Of course, I say that uh, in a country in transition, which is in a different, uh, which has different perspective, but uh, but for the advanced economy in general, I think uh, this is true, and it's one of the reasons why we still have a problem. All central banks in the advanced economy, whether in Japan, in the U.S., in the U.K., or in the, the euro area, are doing things that were unthinkable before the crisis. So we we have all a problem. Second remark, Mandel uh, invented, as you know, the Nobel Prize. Uh, invented the uh, optimal currency area. He said himself, to echo what was just said by Marek, in the US, applying the theory would call for having various currencies in the various states of the United States of America. So we, we, we have to be fully aware also of that. And I will take that in the US, what is very important is labor mobility, by the way, I, I'm looking at Spain sending uh, workers in the rest of Europe, including in Germany, which is generally presented as a total catastrophe, but it is precisely what we call labor mobility. Uh, and in the US itself, it's not that easy. You, you have states with very low unemployment and states with very high unemployment. So this, this is a problem in, that we have to reflect upon, which is, of course, extremely important. Fiscal union, okay. Financial integration, financial integration in the United States of America is more important even than fiscal union in terms of 
shock absorber when you have asymmetric shocks between the various states. So I think uh, th this is also something that we have to reflect, but we are working on that because banking union is precisely a way uh, to fully integrate uh, the financial uh, sector all over the European uh, uh, Euro area and all over the European Union as a whole. And let me only mention something en passant. I hesitate to say that, but uh, nevertheless, I say it. We have a very difficult situation because a number of countries uh, have to adjust. And uh, whether you will like it or not, when you, you are used to uh, spend much more than what you earn at a certain moment, the rest of the world is telling you, we are sorry, we will not finance eternally your deficits. So you have to adjust. And this is painful, this is difficult, this has to be accompanied in an orderly fashion. This calls for, uh, I would say, both conditionality and solidarity, certainly. But nevertheless, even with this period where we are the epicenter of the crisis, from the, st the starting point of the Euro creation, I recomputed job, net job creation in the US and in the Euro area. You know, 310 million people on the one hand, uh, on the one side of the Atlantic, 333 on the other side of the Atlantic. We created today more net jobs than the United States of America since the start of the Euro. So it's only to mention en passant that uh, we, we should not constantly uh, be negative on, on the Euro area. I mean, I try to to be a little bit positive. I, it doesn't mean that we are satisfied, not at all. It doesn't mean that unemployment is not a major problem in Europe as a whole and in some countries in particular, which is really terrible. But it means that the difference that we have with the other major uh, advanced economy is not that negative necessarily. It means that we all have problems. And it's also due to the fact that the uh, participation rate has augmented considerably in Europe. It has diminished in the United States of America. And that explains why an unemployment rate are less flattering in this side of the Atlantic. But again, in, as far as the net job creation is concerned, please recompute, uh, because it's very counterintuitive. <laughs> this is the reality. And again, not to be complacent in any fashion. Uh, we were not complacent, I trust, neither in the General Council nor in the <laughs> Governing Council. And uh, we have to continue to be uh, very tough on the hard work to be, to be done. Uh, <coughs> well, in fact, uh, I'm repeating myself. So my point is very simple that um, it's, n it's nothing against Euro. It's, it's not a negative point. I'm just saying that we cannot ask too much from the monetary policy regime. So it's, uh, it's delivering the price stability, which, which is the fact. Uh, it can be this uh, monetary policy regime. It can be another one as well. And so this is the point that uh, we should not expect resolving structural issues, you know, fundamental factors in the economy. So the, the overall performance of the economy and of the region is determined by other factors. So they don't ask it from, uh, from Euro. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I see a couple of hands, uh, other hands raised up, but allow me now to stop here because we are now discussing more than two hours. I will give each of the participants a last minute uh, statement should you make it. And I will make it in the, uh, should you want to make it, I will make it in the reverse order. So I will start with Zdeněk. Uh, well, I will um, abstain because I did this just a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, thank you for the flexibility, Marek. Uh, the introduction of Euro may have been premature. And, uh, but the consequences of Euro are to change the European continent, politics and society, and hopefully of also economy very profoundly. Uh, structural reforms that are mentioned here uh, are not only about uh, labor market mobility, but also about, well, basically about every aspect of law, economic law. Just to give you one, 10 seconds more, one, 
one uh, fact that divides Europe from the from the US and explains why we are great at vacationing and they are great in uh, in innovation and uh, and uh, entrepreneurship <sighs> bankruptcy law if a company in the US goes bankrupt the legal system basically defends the customer from his creditors so that he can start again in Europe when you go bankrupt the the law the the courts uh, act in the interests of creditors fair maybe very fair but it's counterproductive thank you Jean Glaude please I think we, we had an, uh, an exceptional occasion of uh, looking at all the dimensions of the issue, uh, w which are very, very much economic uh, dimension. And uh, we concentrated, uh, rightly so, on economy. What I understand in the historical process which has started is that uh, we are bound by the not only the lesson of the crisis, but also the lesson of the experience. Even without the crisis, we would have to draw the lesson of the first 14 years. And the lesson are that we have to reinforce our governance, to reinforce what I would call a de facto political, fiscal, economic union, which calls, of course, for a real political union with full democratic accountability. In that sense, I think I'm very close to also what you said. And uh, we are in this process. It's normal that it goes that way. It's a historical process. I don't see too well why it would be so important to say it's, this is bad, this is good as well. We are working. Of course, there is a fundamental decision. Either you are in or out. If you are in, then, as said Marek, uh, you, you try to work to see how it could be better, considering that it is a, a given of this period of European history, in a way. If you're out, more or less, you're thinking that it's not a given of the European history. And to those who are reflecting as if they were out, I would recommend to reflect on the fact that in the worst crisis ever since World War II, which, in my opinion, could have been the worst since World War I, had we not, we central bankers and government, taken very bold and swift decision, the historical process hold. The currency hold, of course, but also the euro area. And now, a last remark, because I experienced myself the negotiation of the Maastricht Treaty. I, I very much negotiated the Maastricht Treaty uh, with Horst Köhler, we were both uh, the uh, Staatssekretär in, in our uh, countries. We, we negotiated at a, a moment where uh, the, the Iron Curtain had not started uh, to collapse. And uh, uh, the main exchange of views, including the main deals, were taken at a moment where, totally wrongly, we did not expect all the uh, Eastern and Central European uh, part of the Soviet Empire to be with us. I mean, we, we were not foreseeing that, wrongly so. I mean, we, we were still reasoning as if we were quietly 12 or 15. And my understanding on the right timing, which I experienced that again in Maastricht with the heads of uh, the European countries, it was very much in my opinion, in the mind of, uh, I don't want to substitute to the heads, but, oh, history is going much faster than we were suspecting, uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, and we have to be sure that we are anchoring uh, the European continent in this period which is uh, so, I would say, both joyful, but also demanding in terms of uh, uh, historical uh, challenge. And that's the reason why I understood they said in any, you might remember there were two windows of opportunity, but they say in any case, which was not in the negotiation. In the negotiation, we did not negotiate the date. And you're absolutely right. Could, could have been this or that. But they wanted to have a deadline. 
and the deadline was 99, the beginning of 90, before 2000. Uh, and that was clearly what they had in mind in Maastricht when the heads themselves put the deadline, which was not prepared at the level of their governments and at the level of their uh, Under Secretary of Treasuries. So again, uh, I, I, I must, I understand your question. At the same time, I think that there are historical reasons for the reason why we are with, with such a given. And I would suggest very, very much to consider that it is a given as, as regards uh, where we are. Now, as you know, uh, we are 17 and 27. The day after tomorrow, we are 18 and 28. There are still 10 countries that did not join. I was extremely happy when the fiscal compact was negotiated by 25 countries out of 27. And can I say that I regret a little bit <laughs> that Denmark, which has an opting out, was in the negotiation and in the signing, and that the Czech Republic, which has no opting out, <laughs> was not. <laughs> But 25 other countries were in, in the business of the negotiation. And of course, I think that Poland played a decisive part in saying, we want to be in. We, we will be in one day, and uh, we don't want you to decide for us. And that, that was a very strong, very strong statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well. In our original statement, we say that Prague 20 wants to be a place where people with different opinions gather and discuss the really pressing issue of today's, not only Czech Republic, but Europe. And that we would like to bring a first class experts and speakers on the subject. And I believe that uh, we succeeded today. I would like to thank very much to Jean-Claude Trichet, because you came to Prague and you knew that it would be, if I'm not saying a hostile <laughs> uh, place, at least it would be a place where maybe no technical discussions about uh, banking union, SSM and SRM and whatever, but that a kind of meditation might take place and uh, a, a discussion proved that uh, your expectations were right. But nevertheless, you came. And not only myself, but we are all extremely happy and proud that you came. But the same applies to Marek. Marek Belka is an acting governor. An acting governor has always kind of a responsibilities which um, makes him much more vulnerable to come and to speak freely on these subjects. And again, Marek, thank you very much. And last but not least, Daniel, you are always a good friend who supported us. Thank you very much for coming. Let me make um, a final announcement. Prague 20 would like to organize again with Aspen uh, for um, still another conference in the fall of this year with this international participation. But we, we would like to inform you via our database and emails that we plan a kind of a change. We also would like to launch in the autumn our regional presence and uh, uh, the first uh, conference which we organize regional oriented will be on 24th of September in Ostrava. But a part of that, we will continue on organizing the, the, the events with, with, uh, with this angle and with international participation. This, comes to, uh, this panel comes to a conclusion. Thank you very much once again to the participants. Thank you for coming, for discussing, and for having a courage to withstand uh, untypical uh, tropical Prague weather. Thank you very much. <laughs>